Undersecretary Mandelka oversees OFAC, FinCEN, Intelligence Agency, and a policy shop, and is charged with developing and implementing US government strategies to combat terrorist financing and money laundering, as well as other policies and programs to fight financial crime. Undersecretary Mandelka has previously served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice, Counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security, Counsel to the T Deputy Attorney General, and as a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York. She is also a former partner at a major New York law firm. Can you please give a very warm welcome to Undersecretary Mandelka. Thank you so much. Thank you and good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. As, uh, as, as was just mentioned, I am the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Uh, and I literally spend my day every day tracking and targeting money laundering, terrorist financing, weapons proliferation, and a myriad of other illicit finance activities. My office consists of more than 800 career professionals who are the best in the world at shutting down the avenues that bad actors use to launder money around the, the globe. Before I get into our efforts specifically involving digital currency, I want to briefly describe for you the offices within the Treasury Department that I oversee. I have OFAC, which is the beating heart of our US sanctions program. I have FinCEN, which oversees compliance with anti-money laundering, combating the financing of terrorism obligations, and which also serves as the financial intelligence unit of the United States. I also have a policy office called the Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes that does extensive international work encouraging other countries to harden their networks against terrorist financing and which also serves as the lead for the United States in the Financial Action Task Force. And I have an intelligence agency, which is a member of the United States intelligence community, which maps illicit financial flows and networks around the world. Each of these components plays a critical role in our efforts to ensure that blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies are not exploited by bad actors. Of course, the idea of using digital currencies to launder money and mask identities is not a new one. In fact, over a decade ago, I led a team of prosecutors at the Justice Department that successfully prosecuted the digital currency eGold. At the time, eGold users were able to set up accounts under names like Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse, and they believed that they could get away with terrible things, including trafficking in child pornography. Well, they were wrong. We convicted eGold's directors of felonies and the companies and they ended up paying multi-million dollar fines. Today, of course, a wide range of bad actors are trying to leverage virtual currencies to make an end run around our laws and regulations, and we are intent on stopping them. I start every morning at the Treasury Department with a briefing on the threats that we face as a nation. And while I'm not going to give away any state secrets, I thought I would start today uh, by sharing some of the challenges that we see facing the virtual currency industry. In recent years, economic sanctions have emerged as one of the top tools in our national security arsenal. Without putting boots on the ground or troops in harm's way, for example, sanctions can help disrupt the operations of state sponsors of terror, 
of human rights violators and weapons proliferators by cutting off their sources of funding and access to the international financial system. In fact, in the last two years, Treasury and our other interagency partners have brought unprecedented economic pressure on regimes like Iran and North Korea, on Russia, among many others. Time and again, as regimes and malign actors are cut off from the global financial system, they are going to search for alternatives. This has resulted, of course, in some countries and rogue actors turning to alternative payment mechanisms like digital currencies to offset the impact of economic sanctions. For example, the Justice Department recently indicted and we sanctioned Park Jin Hyuk. He was part of a North Korean sponsored hacking team known as the Lazarus Group that is allegedly responsible for stealing $81 million from Bangladesh's central bank, among other global attacks. As you'll see on the screen, the Lazarus Group used spear phishing techniques with Bank of Bangladesh employees to gain access to the bank's network. And from there, they accessed the SWIFT payment terminal to cause funds to be transferred out of Bank of uh, Bangladesh's account and into the hands of bad actors. In addition to efforts to steal from banks, the Lazarus Group has also leveraged virtual currency and exchanges to quickly transfer stolen and extorted funds. My team at Treasury backtracked those stolen funds that were moved through various victims' wallets and laundered, laundered through mixers. We traced some of the money through fraudulently opened accounts at exchanges as it chain hopped from one blockchain to another around the world. We then worked closely with law enforcement and international partners to identify those responsible. These types of scheme, schemes and large scale thefts from virtual currency exchanges have been used to generate massive revenues for bad actors. In fact, FinCEN's analysis estimates a billion and a half in stolen funds related to cyber hacks of virtual currency exchangers and administrators over just the past two years. And of course, that's just one avenue uh, where virtual currency is being abused. In addition, several countries, including Iran, Venezuela, and Russia, have launched or announced plans to launch a national digital currency. Some have publicly and brazenly stated that the explicit intent of this currency is to evade our sanctions. As many of you may know, Venezuela's ostensibly oil-backed Petro was the Maduro regime's attempt to establish a national digital currency on top of Ethereum and other blockchains, which failed to attract many investors to this risky venture. But we know that other dictators and rogue regimes will inevitably try to succeed. Like rogue states, terrorist organizations and their supporters and sympathizers are also constantly looking for ways to raise and transfer funds without detection or tracking by law enforcement. On this screen, you will see that in, no in February of this year, Hamas, terrorist organization Hamas, began soliciting donations via social media using two Bitcoin addresses. To make the transactions more difficult to monitor on the public blockchain, Hamas has begun providing unique funding addresses for each person making a donation. And as of late March 2019, the two known addresses had received over $5,000 worth of Bitcoin. This, of course, might not seem like a lot of money, 
but the cost of carrying out a terrorist attack is low. In fact, when FinCEN analyzed millions of dollars of remittance transactions with suspected links to terrorism, it found that they averaged less than $600 each. In an era where a radicalized suicide bomber can bring a tragic end to the lives of hundreds of people for nothing more than the price of duct tape, a vest, and supplies, we simply cannot afford to allow any money to flow to the terrorists. In this context, AML, CFT, and sanctions expectations for the digital currency industry shouldn't be viewed as a chore. It should be viewed as a duty serving our national security. And for all of you, our message is that if your business is to succeed and thrive, then your business model needs to be built on a strong, foundation of anti-money laundering compliance from the very beginning. If you wait until you are contacted by regulators or law, enfor law enforcement, it's going to be too late. For example, bad actors today remain intent on abusing anonymity-enhanced virtual currencies and services designed to hide transaction flows. Just consider that over $140,000 worth of Bitcoin from the global WannaCry 2.0 ransomware attacks was converted into Monero in the months following the attacks to conceal the stolen funds. Products designed to obscure the path of a transaction and enhance anonymity are rife for exploitation by bad actors. Nobody here wants to see your innovative products and services misused to support terrorism and weapons proliferation or become another vehicle for criminals to carry out child pornography or human trafficking. And yet, some of the features of emerging technologies that appeal most to users and to businesses, like speed of transfer, rapid settlement, global reach, and increased anonymity, can also create opportunities for criminals, rogue regimes, and terrorists. It is for this reason that industry compliance with our regulations is so critical. Since 2011, FinCEN's regulations have stated that individuals and entities engaged in the business of accept accepting and transmitting physical currency or convertible virtual currency from one person to another or to another location are money transmitters subject to the AML CFT requirements of the Bank Secrecy Act and its implementing regulations. This includes transactions in fiat to virtual currency as well as virtual currency to virtual currency. Simply put, when IRS or FinCEN examiners show up at the door to your business, they will be looking to see if you complied with all of these requirements. That is, did you register with FinCEN as a money services business? Did you develop, implement, and maintain an AML program designed to prevent them from being used to facilitate money laundering and terrorist financing? And did you establish record keeping and reporting measures including filing suspicious activity reports and currency transaction reports. We will be checking to see whether you did all of this right from the start of your business. 
not just after you got a call from regulators or law enforcement. In fact, virtual currency transmitters, money transmitters, are required to undergo regular, routine compliance examinations, just like every other US financial institution, to help identify weaknesses and ensure compliance. And our, examines, our exam, examinations to date have focused on business models, including virtual currency trading platforms, administrators, virtual currency kiosk companies, crypto precious metals dealers, and individual peer-to-peer -peer exchangers. The point of all of these compliance programs are not to be a roadblock, roadblock to innovation or divert limited resources from a startup. It's to ensure that you establish a reporting system that keeps bad actors away from your business and protects our national security. Remember, you are not only doing this to comply with our regulatory expectations, but to make sure that you are not the next business that North Korea, that Hamas, that narco traffickers or many others exploit. In fact, we have found great partners in your industry committed to this objective. Since 2013, FinCEN has received over 47,000 suspicious activity reports mentioning Bitcoin or virtual currency more broad broadly. Half of these SARs were filed by virtual currency exchangers or administrators themselves. Some of you may have filed these SARs. These filings have been critical to law enforcement efforts. Just take as an example the notorious illicit virtual currency exchanger BTCE. It was SARS filed by both depository institutions and virtual currency exchangers that helped law enforcement identify virtual currency wallet addresses used by BTCE to detect different illicit streams of activity moving through that exchange. We are also pleased to see that some virtual currency companies have developed their own proprietary sophisticated compliance systems to improve responses to law enforcement requests and also overall cyber resilience. Along these same lines, we have seen companies use creative ways to collect and report cyber indicators like device identifiers, IP addresses, wallet addresses, transaction hashes. In fact, it was this innovative reporting led by the private sector that helped influence FinCEN's recent update of the SAR form to explicitly allow for reporting of these cyber specific indicators. We also believe that it is important that the private and public sectors work collaboratively to protect our financial system. That is why just earlier this month we held an information exchange under our FinCEN exchange program industry where we shared illicit finance methodologies with the virtual currency industry and law enforcement to pr better protect the financial system. And of course, last week, FinCEN issued an advisory describing red flags and common typologies used in exploiting virtual currencies in, and businesses. And of course, also just last week, FinCEN issued 30 pages long guidance directly addressing areas of interest gleaned from ongoing industry engagement about how our regulations apply to different business models, such as peer-to-peer -peer exchangers, virtual currency kiosks, decentralized applications, and anonymizing services. I encourage you all to read it very closely. 
In addition, just last week, the Financial Action Task Force, which is the global standard setting body for AML and is currently led by the United States, hosted a private sector consultative forum on the various services and business models in the di digital currency space. And you should expect to see guidance coming out of the FATF in June. We strongly believe that requiring AML CFT standards around the world is vital for creating not only a level playing field, but for ensuring that bad actors don't just gravitate to jurisdictions that have no safeguards. And I also want to be clear that our rules apply to any money transmitter, even if foreign located, so long as they do business in whole or substantial part in the United States. Turning now briefly to OFAC sanctions. OFAC compliance obligations are the same regardless of whether a transaction is in digital currency or traditional fiat currency. OFAC requirements apply equally to brick and mortar banks as they do to the digital currency world. And compliance is not optional. There are civil and criminal penalties if you fail. And while there's no one size fits all sanctions compliance program, there are common themes that are found in all successful sanctions compliance programs. One is developing a tailored risk-based program that accounts for the risks in your particular type of business. Two, know your customers and conduct sufficient due diligence on them before providing services. Three, make sure that you are not conducting prohibited transactions with ind individuals and entities that appear on OFAC sanctions lists or facilitating transfers connected to sanctioned jurisdictions like Iran or involving digital currency addresses highlighted on our sanctions list. And four, communicate with your customer so that they understand the types of transactions and activities that you expect to see from the relationship and the types of activities that you will not do or perform on their behalf. We just recently also published a document outlining these essential components called a framework for OFAC compliance commitments, which you can find on OFAC's website. The other important thing for you to know here is that our sanctions are ever-changing. Our sanctions lists are dynamic with new individuals and entities as well as updated identifying information regularly being added. In fact, barely a week goes by without at least one sanctions action that we've taken. So your compliance process has to be dynamic as well. I also urge you to take our sanctions list and do your own additional analysis to make sure that you are not doing business with designated parties or with parties in sanctioned locations. We find that the best compliance programs are those that incorporate red flags and typologies into their programs to protect their businesses and then use this information to report back to us as appropriate, including through suspicious activity reports. In addition, OFAC sanctions programs target not just specific individuals and entities, but also whole jurisdictions, such as Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Syria, and more. So if your program only runs a check of names against OFAC sanctions lists, you could completely miss other prohibited activity. Early on in the speech, I told you that we will identify where compliance is not taking place and we will take appropriate action. 
In fact, we are very focused on pursuing those who disregard their obligations. As I'm sure everyone here is familiar, we've gone after some of the biggest non-compliant actors in this industry, such as BTCE, which was shut down, and one of its directors and supervisors found himself indicted. But we will also go after individual actors who, while maybe smaller in size, egregiously flaunt their obligations. For example, just last month, FinCEN issued a monetary penalty against a peer-to-peer -peer exchanger named Eric Powers. Mr. Powers failed to register as a money service business and had no written policies or procedures for ensuring compliance with the BSA. He advertised his intent to purchase and sell Bitcoin on the internet and completed a number of transactions directly with darknet market vendors without ever reporting any suspicious transactions. He also conducted over 200 transactions involving the physical currency of more than $10,000 in currency, yet failed again to file a single currency transaction report. As a result of our action, Mr. Powers not only paid a fine, but he is now barred from ever providing money transmission services or participating in the work of any financial institution. That is why we remind all of you that now is the time to make sure that your compliance programs are up to par. In closing, I hope you understand how much we do value your role in protecting our national security and in protecting this industry. We applaud those individuals and entities who make compliance an essential part of their business, and we urge this industry to prioritize compliance before choosing to bring a product or service to the market. Thank you.